everyone. Let me try that again. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Great sunny day, a little windy outside, but it's all good. If you're out in the entryway, we're going to start our second service, so make your way in. If you will, please stand as we worship our good, good Father this morning. not sure. There we go. I'm on. 
Good morning. Glad you're here this morning that you braved the great electrical power outage of 2024 to be here. You're in good company. I guess I need to add a generator to the house prayer request list. So uh, glad you're here this morning. Hey, we have lots to celebrate. Um, we had a blast last Saturday. It was our uh, the egg hunt at the library. Good job, guys. There were a lot of you that came out and volunteered, loved on the community. It was neat to see the community come out. I have already gotten an email forwarded to me from Janelle from the library saying how thankful they were, how great the time was, and how good of an investment it was on their part. Um, not sure if Janine's here, but Janine did a great job getting this organized. And to all of you that came, uh, whether you brought goats or you painted faces or handed out hot dogs, good job, guys. Well done. And uh, I think that flowed into our Easter service. Um, had a lot of folks here, and um, it was fun. Angela did a great job with the brunch. Worship team, you're always stellar. Good job. Thank you. A um, couple of announcements this morning. First, there are, there are two tables out in the lobby, both on this wall. One's out here. It has information about the Togo missions trip that we're taking in November. We're praying for a half dozen to eight individuals that the Lord would lead to go kind of representative of us to the ends of the earth. And I think Togo qualifies. If you don't know where that's at, that's Africa. So going to the ends of the earth that way, as well as on the table out here, there is information about the trip to Israel that I'm going to be leading in February of 25. I get that right? 25? 25. February of 25. So you can check that out. Um, that's, that's coming. As well as April 20th, we have a uh, Parenting on Purpose. It's kind of like a, a date night with a little bolster for all you parents. I was told by my wife, I'm going to be there. So I would love to see you there. A good time. Uh, Miss Susan's putting that together if you've got questions. As well as April 21st, the VBS party is starting early. So if you're a volunteer for VBS on the uh, 21st, you can read about it in the bulletin. It's time. VBS is coming. As well as at the end of this month, we're going to have something a little different, something new. It's a Ministry and Missions Expo. It's going to be in our lobby. We're going to do it in between services and at the end of service. It's kind of to show everybody just what it is we do beyond Sunday morning, what's going on behind the scenes, how we can serve and engage. And we don't just want to be a Sunday morning church, okay? There's social clubs for stuff like that. We want to be a body of believers that's engaged in meaningful ways for the sake of Jesus. And so at the end of the month, that's what we're looking at. And running up to that, each Sunday, we've been putting together a video about one, just different ministries. I think we've had security. Help me, babe. Who was for? We had LifeBridge. And this morning, we have our youth director, Tana. So you may be seated. we got a short video here. My name is Tana Muse, and I am the youth director here at Crow Hill Bible Church. I just always had a passion for youth, and so I... Um, asked Jared if I could help with like middle school or something and so that was 2019 and I just love it because our kids really want to be here they really want to be here on Sunday nights and our Wednesday night life groups and um, I love how excited they are I, I'm really thankful for where I live and where I get to work because I just think the youth here are really special we're really focused on small group here. We like a lot of time with the kids being able to talk to each other. The small group is nice because it allows the youth to actually talk to each other and talk about what's going on in their lives instead of just hearing about what we want to say to them. I feel like God has used me in multiple youth's lives. To have the opportunity to be in their lives has just been an honor and I will, I will always appreciate each one of their each relationship I've always appreciated and it was I'm really thankful I got to be there and I know there's gonna it's just the beginning I'm excited for what God has in store for them so 
I just think it's an honor that God allows me to be there for them when sometimes they need a little extra. <laughs> so yeah. I just, I'm so thankful for our leaders, our teachers, um, the people that show up and help. And I, I do feel like that the youth feel like they can come to youth group and feel loved and feel valued and feel seen and feel heard. And that's a huge part to the leaders that I have who volunteer. And so I'm just, I'm so thankful for them. I'd like to thank Tana for her dedication, making me cry again. That was, I knew it was coming, but you know, if you will, please stand. We'll continue our worship this morning.
praise before you this morning. We lift our hands up to you in submission, Lord, to worship you, and I pray that we do that every day. We thank you for your love and your arms that wrap around us and for your goodness. In your precious name, we give you praise and glory this morning. Amen. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his loving kindness and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth and sing for joy and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Shout joyfully before the King. The Lord. Let the sea roar and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. 
before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the people with equity. Father, this morning as we continue to worship, as we hear your word, Lord, may our response be one of gratitude and praise. Lord, you've given us so much. Uh, We lose electricity and we realize just the conveniences that we have. And yet, Lord, you are constant. And there is a day when your son will come again. We long for that day. Lord, until that day, I ask that you would be with those in this body who are struggling physically and facing hardship. Lord, would you walk closely with them? Lord, for those that have entered into life seasons that have surprised them, those that are struggling with emotional pain or want, Lord, would you meet our needs? And Father, would we never forget how much you love us. It's in the wonderful, matchless name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Take a minute and greet those around you. If you are like me, you love a good story. Uh, When I turned uh, 30, I discovered hunting for the first time in my life. I don't know how many hunters we got out there. But I'll tell you, to know a hunter is to know someone that will tell you a story. (laughs) There's always a story, and it's always a little embellished. (laughs) You know, in my office, I, uh, I've got this um, turkey fan. Yes, I killed it, lest you doubt it. And uh, here's its beard, if you didn't know. The longer the beard, the older the turkey, usually the bigger the turkey. Um, I keep it next to my uh, couch in the office. It, I also got the turkey legs, just to keep it weird. I hung it right next to the couch, so like when people come in, they hang out for about 30 minutes, and then they see these turkey legs, like, hey, I need to get going, you need to get going. <laughs> There's a story, but you'll have to come in and ask about it. You know, I'll talk your ear off about a hunt, but there are some stories that we're hesitant about. Maybe we don't like the story or we think the story is boring or lame. You know, early on in my walk with Jesus, I felt that my story about coming to Christ was kind of boring. I grew up in a Christian home where both parents were pursuing Jesus and I came to Christ at five and You know, my story is not one of coming away from sex, drugs, or rock and roll. And I was like, that's boring. I was hesitant to talk about the fact that Jesus stepped into my life and he saved me. You know, you and I can be skittish when it comes to our story or what some may call a testimony. We're in a uh, new sermon series Um, called The Basics. We want to make sure our roots are well-grounded, and I don't know if you have the slide back there, but over the next five weeks, we're going to look at our story, my story, our community, his kingdom, baptism, and communion, and um, the basics of Christianity, our faith. 
And there are times that you and I can be skittish, kind of like a turkey, with our story. This morning, my heart for us is that there would be a couple things that would help you and I increase our confidence in both how to share our story and in our story. This morning, I want to look at how we can map out our story of coming to Christ And we're going to do that in three ways, real simple, okay? What is a testimony or story? Why is it important? And how do I map it out or use it, okay? What, why, and how? That's where we're going this morning. This morning, um, our time in the Word is going to be a little different. We're going to be in a large passage, and we're going to look at part of it, and then we're going to cherry-pick a little. I usually don't do that, but with this, it will work well. So if you have your Bible or your smartphone, turn or pull up to Acts 26. I'm going to read the first 11 verses. The whole chapter is about Paul's story, a little context, the book of Acts, First is the Acts of the Church. It's the history of the church in its inception and coming to being. The first half of the book follows the Apostle Peter, and then it shifts to the Apostle Paul. By the time we get to chapter 26, Paul is hanging out in a, uh, a prison. He's, he's under arrest up in the northern part of Israel. Shameless plug here. If you decide to go to Israel with me in a year, I'll take you to where Paul was imprisoned. It's really cool. It's a bunch of Roman ruins, but it's up in Caesarea. Paul's been hanging out, and basically what the Romans or the the Jewish Romans are doing is they're just trotting through leadership of the country, and they want to hear Paul's story because everybody knew about Paul, and they didn't understand what was going on, and so all the bigwigs were coming in to check out his story. And in chapter 6, Paul is making a defense. He's sharing his story in front of a king. So let's read verses 1 to 11. Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make a defense. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee, according to the strictest sect of our religion." And now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promise to which our twelve tribes hope to obtain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O king, I am being accused by the Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. Here in this passage... Paul is presenting his story to a king. The first part we read is what Paul's life looked like before Christ. If you would read the whole chapter, it would be before Christ, coming to Christ, what he believed, and after Christ, just real simply. This morning, I want to look at what is a testimony, our story. And real simply, I like Paul's example. If you are a follower of Christ, if you have a story about Jesus intersecting your life, real simply, there was before Christ, there was coming to Christ, and there was after Christ. 
You know, your story is unique as a follower of Christ. It's not the same as the person sitting next to you or the person on the opposite side. Paul's story was unique. It's interesting in this chapter, 21 times he uses the term I. He's talking about himself, his story. He's telling facts about himself. You know, there's a lot of things that we can argue about, right? We like to argue, don't we? You do, come on. We could argue about politics. We can argue about the weather. We can argue about the temperature of the coffee, right? We find tons of things to argue. You could argue with me that Purdue is not the best team in the nation right now in basketball. You would be wrong, but that's okay. We could argue about it. You know what you can't argue about is someone's story. You may be skeptical. You may disagree, but it's their story. Even a fool won't argue with someone's story. Here Paul is sharing his story, and you and I as followers of Christ have a unique story that no one can argue with. It's ours. It's ours. Paul here talks about before Christ. Then he shifts at verse 13 about coming to Christ, what he believes. It's the core of his faith. He hints at it in verse 8. He says he's talking about the resurrection of the dead. His audience didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. He knew that. You know, he doesn't shy away from that. He puts that right out there. If we look at verse 13, he tells his story. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, and they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Here Paul unpacks what he believes, and basically it's Jesus that Jesus has risen, that there was forgiveness of sins to be had, and that Paul was on the wrong side of the equation. I like when he talks here that he's talking, he tailors his story to his audience. I think sometimes when it comes to our story, we feel like we have to be cookie cutter or canned. And that's not the case. It depends who we're talking to, who's standing in front of us. Later in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gives his theological belief real simply. Jesus died for sin, was buried, rose, and he appeared. Boom, that's it. We make the gospel way too complex. Then we get nervous about it. We don't talk about it. Before Christ, first paragraph. Coming to Christ, second paragraph. We won't read it, but the third paragraph is... What was life after Christ? Paul, in the last paragraph, basically says, Hey, you all know, word on the street, I was a persecutor, and now I'm in prison, and I'm a preacher. You can't argue with that. (laughs) You can't argue. They have a saying in the Midwest, I don't know if it's here, it's the proof is in the pudding. You guys have that one? I think it's an English saying, so if you've got English roots, you've heard that. You know, when it comes to salvation, I'm competent in one person's salvation. That's mine. And I've been around long enough, and I've watched people long enough. There's a lot of people that say they're good with Jesus. You know, they like Jesus, they love Jesus, they're fascinated by whatever. 
There are people that claim that Christ is their Savior. Paul here has an after story. It's not just that they prayed a prayer or aligned with something. It was that there was life change. Paul's life was changed. There was an after to his story. Um, I remember a while back, I give you an example of this. I went over to a lady's house. I was friends with her husband, and um, her husband was loved Jesus, faithful servant. You'd see him all the time. Never would see her, the wife. One day I went over, and she had a rough life. We are in their living room, and I was sharing my story with her. And I got done, and her life was really a mess at that point. And I said, hey, would, would you like to accept this? Would you like to have a story? And she said, yeah, I would. And there in her living room, you know, she prayed. And I thought, well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Next week, she showed up at church. And let me be real clear here. Coming to church doesn't save anybody, right? Right? Are we all good with that? Okay. But it's often the sign of a believer being healthy. They want to be around other believers. They want to grow. They want to hear the word. They want to worship. She came for a week. I was watching from a distance. Next week, she didn't show up. Heard small town. Hear things in small towns, right? <laughs> Heard she was kind of just doing her own thing. It was like water off a duck's back. Was she saved? I don't know. I don't know. In contrast to one night, it was a Sunday evening. It's a small crowd, and there was a man sitting in the back that I had never seen. Had a hoodie on. By the way, if you come to church and you wear a hoodie, either me or security will come up and be like, Hey, what's up? Nice to meet you. This dude was in the back, had his hoodie on. He looked rough. So I saddled up next to him. I said, hey, what's your name? He said, my name's Bob. I said, what's up, Bob? He said, oh, I'm from here and there. He was staying at the hotel. It was a motel across the street that I wouldn't have put my enemy in. I was like, oh, you're over there. We ran out of things to talk about. I said, hey, where are you at spiritually, Bob? I'm one of the pastors here. I've never met you, and you're sitting on the back row today. He said, you know, I'm not in a good place. I'm an alcoholic. I've lost my job. I've lost my family. I've tried multiple times to kick this addiction, and I can't. And tonight, something just said I should walk in here. This would be a safe place. I said, well, I can't do much for your addiction, Bob, but I know a guy said, what do you mean? And then I shared my story about how Jesus had changed my life. And I looked at Bob, and he goes, well, I've done religion. And I, I get all, I said, I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about, Bob. I'm talking about you and Jesus. You accepted Jesus as your Savior. Have you placed your faith that his death for your sin makes you a different man? You know, over the next couple of weeks, I think Bob came to Christ. The next Sunday, he was supposed to come to church, and he didn't show up. And I drove across the street to the motel and went and knocked on his door. Found out two days later he'd gotten bumped on Saturday, so he hit the bar, and he got hammered and passed out in his room. And that's where he was when I was knocking. But, you know, the next Sunday he came, and then the next. And slowly, you know what happened? Bob's eyes started to look different. Now, get me wrong, his life was still a mess, but there was hope in Bob's eyes. After a couple months, Bob had about six months at the church, and he grew like a weed, and then he found a job in Washington with family, so he took it. I got a letter about two months later. It said, hey, I'm keeping down my job. Haven't touched alcohol. I'm reading my Bible every day. I'm growing in Jesus. I took a call from him a week later. I said, hey, Bob, did you find a good church? He goes, there's a great church. It's a small church. 
They're loving me well. One had a story, and it was a life change. The other one had a story, but the proof's in the pudding, is it not? Not a perfect life. Got to be careful here. There's no perfect life. It's not perfection. It's who you know. And he is in the business of changing lives. Do you have a story before Christ, coming to Christ, after Christ? It's a testimony. It's yours. It's like no one else's. What's testimony? It's your story. Second, why is a testimony important? I've got three passages here just in different parts of Scripture. The first one, I'll give you a second to read it. Always being ready to make a defense. I like that. That's from Peter. But what is Paul doing here? He's making a defense. Why is the testimony important? Because you and I as followers of Christ are commanded to know our story. This is it. It's not Michael telling you. It's the word. It says be ready. If God would intersect you with someone that did not know Jesus and they would said, what, what is the hope that you have? Would you be able to articulate it? Would you be able to real succinctly say, hey, before Christ, this is what life was like, and here's what I believed, and here's what Christ has done for me. What are you going to do? You see, if we will take the time to own our testimony, it will help us be confident in our faith. Sadly, a lot of times when I talk to believers who I believe are followers of Christ, they'll say, hey, tell me your story, and I call it the airplane method. They fly all around Jesus and the gospel, but they never quite articulate the gospel clearly. Why is that? Because we're nervous. And you're, you know. But if you'll take the time to write out in three paragraphs before Christ, coming to Christ, you won't be nervous. Now that seems real complex. It's not that complex. Can you write out three paragraphs? If you can, then you can live up to this verse. Without a plan, little is accomplished. With a plan, you'll have confidence. Got a little secret. It's a pastoral secret. You ready? Get in close. When I preach, I never preach on the fly. I've always prepared. You know how nervous I would be if I didn't prepare? I wouldn't even get up here. Like, you couldn't pay me enough. I prepare. It's the same thing with the testimony. Next verse. Why is the testimony important? Revelation 12, 11. I'll let you read it. Do you realize that your, your story is an offensive weapon? It's not a shield, it's a sword. I love this verse. Notice what overcomes Satan. Two things, and they go together. Jesus' blood and your story. That's power. We sing there's power in the blood. They've got a nice hymn for that. We don't have the hymn for there's power in your story, or maybe we do. I love to tell the story. I love to tell the story. Satan has blinded this world, and you and I are their only hope for being salt and light. And can I, can I double down on this one? Crow Hill, when it comes to the... There are, there are great churches up here that are serving Jesus, but in some ways, they're each unique as I'm getting to know them, which is cool. It's how Jesus works, right? We don't compete. It's not how it works. This church, you can't drive down 285 without seeing. This church has resources. We are to be a light 
to the community as a body and as individuals. There's power. It's not you and me. It's his spirit and his story in us. When I was in seminary, I wish they would have done this, but it was for a previous generation. Often in the preaching classes, they would have 10 to 12 students. They were more like labs. And the story goes that when the seminary was first founded, that the preaching professors would take their 10 students into the cemetery next door. And the two shouldn't be confused, cemetery (laughs) and seminary. You know, it happens sadly, but they're different. And the professor would take his students out and he would have them face the tombstones and he would go back behind the tombstones and he would call them up one at a time and they would have to preach their 10-minute sermon to the tombstones. And when one of the brighter students asked, why are we doing this? He said, because your job is only to preach the word. It is not to give life. Only Jesus brings the dead to life. And if you have a story, there was a time when you were dead. In Christ, you heard his word, his spirit moved, and you came to life. There is no shame. That is the ultimate story. Before Christ, coming to Christ, after Christ, Your story and the Spirit, they are powerful and they are effective enough to raise the dead. Last passage. Why? The first reason why is you and I are commanded to know our story for a defense. Second, your story is an offensive weapon that the Spirit will use if you will let Him. And third, our story glorifies the Savior. This one has two slides. The man who was demon-possessed before Christ. Jesus intersects him, and he comes to Christ. And afterwards, he says, Jesus... Can I go with you? May I follow you? And Jesus says, no, I need you to go back and share your story with those who won't meet me. Our story glorifies our Savior. Here is our fear. Our fear is that if we share our story, we'll somehow get it wrong and someone will go to hell. I mean, that's literally what we think, right? Like, send someone else. Like, let someone else share their story. But that's not how God likes to work, does he? He likes to take your unique story and intersect it with someone who needs to hear your story, not my story. And he uses it. I remember being in college, and I was trying to grow in my faith. I was trying to take steps of faith, and I still am. I was... 19, now I was 20, and uh, I had a mentor who had been working with me, and we were going door to door in the dorm where I lived, and we were sharing my story. <laughs> I remember knocking on one of the doors, it was an all-male dorm, had 2,000 men, and it. it had been built after World War II, it was the largest non-military dorm in the country, it was at Purdue. <sighs> Sorry, <laughs> can't contain myself. And the rooms were small. They actually, they had brought the GIs out of Germany and they'd put them three in a room where in the room I could almost spread my arms and touch each wall. And they thought it was great. I knocked on the door and the door opened and it was real dark and the box fan was on and the guy that stood before me looked like death warmed over. He was all sweating and pasty. And I was like, man, they're doing drugs in here. What's going on? And um, I said, I was ready. I said, hey, uh, we're, I don't know if we had a spiritual survey or something, but we got to the point, I was like, can we share a story about Jesus and how he's changed our life? And the guy was like, yeah, come on in. I've been reading my Bible and praying. I got a whole bunch of questions, but I got the flu. 
And I was like, Lord, not only do you have to pick on me and I'm knocking door to door sharing my story, but I'm about ready to get the flu. Whatever. So I walk in the door and this guy sits on his bunk and I'm like trying not to touch anything. And I'm... We, it was, there are many ways to share your faith, you know, before Christ, coming to Christ, after Christ. And this one was called the bridge illustration. And I had practiced the bridge. It was too complicated. There's easier ways. And I get halfway through this thing, and I'm like, oh, we might as well set this bridge on fire because I'm butchering the gospel right now. Like, I started with the last, the beginning. This dude's looking at me, and he's just sweating. Like, he's wiping, you know, he's coughing, and he's snotting everywhere. We get done. I walk out. I'm like, oh, my goodness. And the door shuts, and I look at my mentor. I'm like, I broke the bridge, didn't I? And he goes, well, he was a real nice guy. Well, yeah, you, you know. And he said, Michael, it's okay. And I remember just being so frustrated with myself. I called the guy back two days later. And I remember walking with him to the fountain at Purdue. And there he accepted Christ as his Savior. It's, it's not the messenger. It's not being slick. It is being prepared. And willing. His name's Zaid Shaw. He's a brain surgeon now. He's got a wife with, I think, a fourth kid on the way. He loves the Lord. He's living for Jesus. And here's the fact. Had I not shown up at his door, God would have brought someone else. What is a testimony? It's your story. Why is a testimony important? Because we are commanded to give a defense. It is an offensive weapon. And when we share our story, it gives glory to the Lord. Last, how do I map out my story? Remember I promised what, why, how. Here we go. Three things. Keep it short. Keep it sweet. And keep it simple. Let me explain. Keep it short. I would encourage everyone here this morning, if you know Jesus, this week, go home. Three paragraphs. Before Christ. Coming to Christ. After Christ. I'll tell you what. This is the professor in me. I would love for you to send me your testimony. I'll pull out my red pen and I'll put A++ before I even read it. And I would love to give it back to you with suggestions. But I know that for those in this room that will take the time to write out their testimony before Christ coming, Christ, you will be able to give it. But it takes a little effort. In the last season at the church I was at, I made the same offer. I had about 75 individuals. I had a file. If you do it, you will bless me. I promise, A++. <laughs> do put your name on it or I won't be. I always have one or two. Put your name on it. It's like clap. Put your name on it so I can get it back to you. Keep it short. Don't make your story complicated. Second, keep it sweet. Two hints to a sweet story. In that middle part, before Christ, coming to Christ, after that, coming to Christ, don't give me a bunch of Christian mumbo-jumbo verbiage. Like if you grew up Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, who knows what, you got your own language there. I don't care if you walked an aisle. I don't care if you were at First United Methodist camp of the Pentecostal Brethren. I don't care. I don't know where that's at. That means nothing to me. What I want to know is what do you believe about Jesus? I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. And I accepted him as my Savior. And this is where I happen to be. Good. You nailed it. That makes it sweet. The second thing that will make it sweet is if you put some scripture in there. 
There's tons of verses. Just pick one. John 3.16, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 10.9 and 10, Ephesians 2.8 and 9. Pick a verse that has gospel in it. I'm not believing your story. I'm believing what you're saying about the word in Jesus. When I share, I either like to use John 3.16 or Romans 6.23. You know why? I memorized it when I was like four. I can say it cold, upside down, in a sweat, in a room with someone that's got the flu. That's what you want. Keep it easy. Before Christ, coming to Christ, after Christ, tell us what you believed. Keep it sweet. Short, sweet, and simple. And here's the simple fact. There will be some of you that get the opportunity to share your faith. Those that share their faith are ones who are praying for opportunities to share their faith. We know that, follower of Christ. I'm reminding us this morning. You and I as followers, we should have, I'll suggest two people. Pick someone in your family that doesn't know Jesus and pick someone that can't get away from you that's not in your family that knows Jesus. I've got one in my family that I'm praying that Jesus gets a hold of them, and I'm ready when they're ready. And I'm hunting for a house and sign some uh, realty contracts. I have a realtor that I'm not sure where he's at with Jesus, and he's got to work with me. (laughs) That's who I know right now up here. But darn it, if I'm going to pay him 3% to buy a house... He's going to hear my story, isn't he? (laughs) That's probably how I'll load it up. Hey, I'm sorry, you signed a contract with me. (laughs) You're getting money and I'm getting to share about my Jesus. Starts with prayer and a plan. Prayer and a plan. How do we map out a personal testimony? Three paragraphs. You give me four, I'll send it back. Before Christ, coming to Christ, after Christ. I had someone come up after first service, and he was like, I don't really like the after part. I was like, you probably don't like Purdue either. And uh, no, that, that, and, and I kind of agreed with him because it's not an after, it's a forever once you know Christ. I like that. Can I tell you one last story and then we'll shift into communion? And I am serious about the offer with the three paragraphs. That would bless me as your pastor. You can email it, you can slide under the door, you can stick it in the mailbox. I'd love to read your story. I was 17 years old. I had just worked at an inner city youth camp for a week. Um, This wasn't like Adra Haji. Um, we, it was a camp where kids that lived in the hood of Indianapolis, they had a a youth program, and if they went so many times, they would freely get funded, and we would go into southern Indiana. It's a little, little rural. And I'd been there the whole week, and neat counselors that served at the camp, all of the guys that served at the camp, they had these phenomenal testimonies like they were drug addicts they were hippies they were living for sex this and that and all of a sudden you know Jesus intersect their lives and they're just different people they'd grown up in broken homes and after hearing five or six of these testimonies usually around a campfire at night I found that I don't know if it was jealousy or just embarrassment I thought, my testimony is not that neat. Remember, I was on the back porch with my dad, and he was fixing something. He's down on his hands and knees, and I just was jawing at him. And I was like, Dad, why is my testimony so boring? My dad set his tools down, turned and looked at me, gave me one of those kind of weird parent to a teenager. I used to not know why he gave me that look. (laughs) I know now. (laughs) So he gave me that look. He said, why? I said, Dad, I came to Christ at five. I wasn't delivered from anything. 
And all those guys at camp had these amazing stories, and the kids, they listened to these stories. My dad, who had a very broken childhood, turned and looked at me, and he said, Michael, those guys that tell those stories, they would give anything to have your testimony. And on that day, my testimony ceased to be boring. And my friend, listen to me this morning. If you know Jesus, if you know that you are His, that you've been bought by the blood of the Lamb, your past matters not because your future is going to be glorious. Let's pray. Father, the word is bold. Make us bold. Not unprepared, not flippant, not brash, but bold. And Father, I asked this morning, I specifically asked there would be many here that would take me up, that they would do the little exercise, which is not a little thing, of writing out their story. Lord, I ask that we would be a praying church, both collectively and individually, that you would give us a heart for the lost. We can be so comfortable here. We can, we can do our thing during the week and come in on Sunday, and there is a world that is lost They are so blind and it is so broken and they are looking for help. We, our story, we have the answer. Lord, we don't have to be like Billy Graham. We don't have to be a pastor. We could be moms and dads and coworkers and neighbors and friends and family members and we're just telling our story. Burden us, Lord. burden us. And Father, I'd be remiss. I thank you that at five, you caught hold of my life. I am grateful. It's in the great name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We're now going to shift to communion. I invite those that are serving to come forward. Go ahead, go ahead. As we come to the Lord's table this morning, um, I want to remind us of a couple things and just kind of guide our thinking as we spend time and as the music plays. Um, This morning, the table is for those that have a personal relationship with Jesus. If you don't have a story That's fine, talk to someone this morning. But this only holds meaning for those that know Jesus as their Savior, that he died, that he was buried, and that he rose. Also, as as we come forward and take the bread and the juice and we go back and sit, and as you have time to contemplate, I want you to contemplate two things this morning. Communion is a great time to check your vertical relationship with God. And listen, for those who know him, he never lets us go. The line's never broken from his end, but sometimes we get like garbage and lint and crud going this way, don't we? If there's something that the Spirit is saying, hey, this is garbage in your life and you need to fess up and deal with it, listen, we can't always fix it, but we confess, can't we? First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will step in and change us. We just need to be honest with Him. Lord, here, I got this. I'm struggling with this. Will you forgive me? Will you, will you work here? He loves you and me. Once you do that, check your horizontal relationships you've been uh, jerkish to someone this last week 
And the Spirit's like, hey, you were you cut across them. That's a brother and sister in Christ. You need to deal with that. Pass on communion. It's okay. We'll be here next month and next month and until Jesus comes back. But this is a great time to order your heart with the Lord. So let me pray for us and then we'll stand and you can come. Father, this morning as we come to your table, this is your idea. It's commanded by you and it's for us to remember of what you've done for us, but also there is a sense of we bring our heart before you. And Lord, you, you take us where we're at and you call us deeper in. So Lord, may we be honest, may we do business with you this morning. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. As we stand, you can come and This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. In the valley, I know that you're with me, and surely your goodness and mercy follow me. So my weapons of praise and thanksgiving, this is how I fight my battle. And I This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. surrounded but I'm surrounded by you it may look like I'm surrounded but I'm surrounded by you it may look like I'm surrounded but I'm surrounded by you it may look like I'm surrounded but I'm surrounded by you 
It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. 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 This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. Scripture says in Matthew 26, 26, While they were eating, Jesus took some bread. And after blessing it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, Take eat. This is my body broken for you. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. His blood. Father, I thank you that you sent your Son, that we can have a story before Christ, that our faith is rooted all in Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection for sin, for sinners like me. And even more, Lord, that there is an after to the story, that you change lives. But it's not just after, it is forever. And Father, we look forward to when you send the Son and you make all things all things new. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we close the service, I'd invite you to stand for the blessing. We'll have a prayer team down on each side. It'd be a privilege. We pray every Sunday. We lo- it's a confidential opportunity to anything you got going on in your lives, as well as we want to be a praying church. We have individuals that are praying downstairs at both 8.30 and 9.30, if I have the, t- nope, excuse me, 8 and 9.30, we would love to have any of you join us as the Lord leads. It's real low key, um, as well as, one more thing, um, there was pizza with the pastor and staff today. I hear it's still on. It's just going to be a little later. The pizza should be here about 12.10. We've got people that are working really hard to serve us. I could either preach longer or... Or we can close with a blessing and just hang out in the foyer. I'm going to opt for the second. (laughs) A blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace because he has given you a story. May you have peace. Go in his peace.